trustworthy. There is no shadow of turning with him. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is trustworthy. And I trust that you have placed your faith and trust in him. And as a believer, you are walking by faith in the promises of God. Because if you're not, if you've got your eyes on this world, you ought to be a little bit concerned. <laughs> you know, if you're looking out and yeah, it's not real pretty at times. But if you've got your eyes on the focused on the eternal, unchanging, inerrant promises of our God and our Christ, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, then we have hope. We have hope because he is faithful and trustworthy. And we're here today because of him. We're here to sing his praises. We're here to exalt his name. It is not about any person, any ministry. It is about Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And uh, we just want to exalt him and praise his name. And we thank you for being here to help us do that. So especially if you're visiting with us this morning, thank you for taking time to come in and be a part of the service. And uh, we just uh, trust our time will be an encouragement and a blessing to you. If we can be of help to you, if we can serve you, answer questions for you, anything like that, let us know after the service. But we're just so glad to have you as part of our service. I do want to pause, just thank those who are watching at home, could not be with us in person, but you're watching by way of live stream. Thank you as well. And we welcome you today. What a beautiful day. There are like a million other things you could be doing. And I'm glad you're not. I'm glad you decided to come this morning. And, uh, you know, we live in Florida, so there's a lot of sunshine to come. There'll be plenty of time to do other things, but this is the first day of the week, the first few hours. We're here to celebrate our Savior, Jesus Christ, and so thank you for being here this morning. When you came in this morning, I trust you received one of our bulletins. Um, we do that most every week, and you may wonder why do we give you a bulletin when we, you come in. There's a lot of things you could do with it. Obviously, you can fan with it, and that, you know, there's some Sundays you may need it. Obviously, you can color on it and a doodle and whatever else you want to do, so those things. But we do have a purpose, and uh, so just directing your attention to it this morning for a couple of minutes. We don't normally do this, but I do just want to emphasize, you know, each week we do have our Missionary of the Month. In our, in one of the inserts this morning happens to be our Missionary of the Month form. I just want to point out that we are, for this month, uh, highlighting the ministry of Jason and Lori Holt, our missionary partners down in um, Chile. And uh, we're so thankful for their family, for their ministry. There's a website they have. You can go find out more about their ministry. But be praying for them. There's some updated needs and prayer requests there. So we thank you for that. There's other prayer requests there, some for the Bells, some of their recent prayer requests. They're in Thailand right now. So be praying for them and their needs. And so we do have those things along with our outline. We also always have our calendar in there. I just highlight that this morning. One of the things there, in fact, the first thing is just a reminder. This summer, we are going to Hope Children's Home over in Tampa for our missions trip, doing a domestic trip this year. And we'd love to have you be a part of that this morning, following the morning service. As soon as we're dismissed, for those who are interested in going, you may have signed our list or you may not have. Josh will be meeting with you right up front after the service this morning and to have some up-to-date information on that. That trip, by the way, is the week of July the 8th. So if you're available, uh, we'd love to. And coming this morning and meeting uh, is no obligation to go. Just come get the information that might help you make that decision. So we'd love to have you go. And um, it's great to get on the property of Hope Children's Home, kind of see what they're doing, and uh, just have a, a renewed appreciation for the ministry. And so uh, that's going to happen this morning. There's other things here. Just make a note of the things coming up, a couple of missionary speakers. But I did really ultimately want to get you to the back page this morning. So if you note that, the top part is not changed. Those are just some of the ways that we stay connected and online, et cetera. And you, if you didn't know that information, make sure you look at it. But the little part in the box is what's different. Um, we just want to, we're always striving to try to do a better job of communicating, communicating events, announcements, things like that. And um, one of the areas that we have not really tapped into is doing that by way of texting. And so we want to do more of that. And Josh has established some ways we can do that. So you'll note some ways that you can kind of plug into that part of our communication system. Now, let me say this. If you presently are in our directory or receive our weekly emails, you really don't need to do anything. We're going to just 
plug you into that system and uh, you'll still continue to receive information and probably just get a little bit more um, announcements and some timely things. And uh, so we'll do that. And if there's ever a time that you don't want to uh, receive those, um, you'll have the option to unsubscribe or to stop those texts. We promise we're not gonna uh, overload you with those, but it just is a better way to communicate. But if you do not receive those things, you would like to be informed of what's going on and you'd like to get plugged into that, there's a simple way to do it by way of text on your phone. So just wanted to kind of highlight that, some of the ways we're trying to communicate better, trying to get you the information you need to have so that you can be involved and uh, be a part of what we're doing. The other thing, one of the other ways that we do that, one of the other ways we really strive to get to know one another better is through our directory, and you'll know we did an update for our directory. That is now actually available online on our website. And so if you're in our directory, we, that is password protected. But if you're in our directory, um, we will give you, if you don't already have that password, that, so the new directory is up already available. So you can go and see that, view that online. If you need that password, you can talk to Josh after the service. And then if you have inform, in, interest in being a part of that and um, having access to that, again, he'll ask, answer any questions that you have. So all of that's important. I know it's just taking a few minutes this morning. We need to communicate. We want to do better. We're trying to get to know one another better. And uh, so thank you for your help and cooperation in all of those uh, aspects of our communication. Well, let's take our hymn books one more time. This time, number one. Number one, my Savior's love. What a wonderful hymn. We'll stand together as we sing number one, my Savior's love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the When 
books and stand once more and turn to 484. At this time, Children's Church may be dismissed. 484, a child of the king. Let's all stand together and sing. No greater pleasure, no, no greater privilege to be a child of the King of Kings, child of God. We have been born again. If you have been born again, you are now a child of God. John says, what manner of love, what manner of love he hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, the children of God. That is an incredible love. And, and, and notice that. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us. It doesn't say, oh, how lovable you must be because you're called a son of God. <laughs> it's not how lovable you, the emphasis is not on how lovable you are, it's on how loving he is. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. What a wonderful thought. Well, this morning is a little bit special. We are putting off our study in 1 Timothy one more week. And uh, ladies, yes, next week is your week. I, I just, one request. I just request that you leave your stones at home <laughs> next week. That's all I ask. Just leave your stones at home. But um, we'll get back into our study of 1 Timothy. But uh, this morning, we will end our service this morning with a brief child dedication service. And so our emphasis this morning is on the family. And we'll have three families represented this morning in the service. They're just publicly... Um, asking for our prayer and acknowledging their desire to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So we look forward to ending our time this morning that way. But we have a copy of our outline in the bulletin this morning and I invite you to join me. You'll notice we're just kind of looking at some selected passages this morning. But three primary places you could put a finger or a bookmark. Deuteronomy chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, and Proverbs chapter 22. Uh, we'll mention and turn to maybe one or two others, but those will be the primary places if you're there, um, primary key passages we'll look at. Deuteronomy 
6, Ephesians 6 and Proverbs 22. Well, let's bow in prayer this morning and ask the Lord's blessings on his word. Father, we just rejoice with you this morning. Thank you so much that you have loved us with an everlasting love, an incredible love that, Father, you placed your love on us even while we were sinners, while we are your enemies, you loved us, had compassion on us, had mercy on us, and sent your son to pay our penalty on the cross of Calvary. And for that, we worship you, we love you, we thank you, we praise you, and we desire to know you and so we can live our life for your glory. That's our prayer this morning. And even as we open your word this morning, we pray that you'll help us to understand it so we can apply it to our lives. First and foremost, we pray for our parents here this morning and just pray that you'd encourage them, challenge them. But Father, we just plead that you would help them in their journey of raising their ch children and those of us that may be um, in different seasons of life, maybe not yet parents or have been or whatever that may look like, we just pray that our hearts would be receptive to what you have for us from your word this morning so that we can encourage those who are and then we can help and instruct others what your design and what your plan for the family is. So we just thank you for what you'll do. We give you the glory. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our, journey, our incredible journey, my wife and my incredible journey of parenting, believe it or not, started 34 years ago this month. Yes, our oldest son, Micah, was born 34 years ago this month. It's hard to believe it's been a 34-year journey. And if you were to ask me, how do you describe, how would you describe your experience of parenting? Well, you ask a lot of people that question, you get all kind of answers. Some people might say, um, well, it's like herding cats. Or, it's, you know, I, this is one of my favorites. It's like folding a fitted sheet. Yeah, you know how frustrating that can be. Just when you think you have it, you don't have it. So there's a lot of ways to describe what parenting, the parenting experience is like. But uh, when I started thinking about that, I thought, you know what? Something recent came to my mind. And that is just a couple of months ago, my youngest daughter, Grace, and I, um, she uh, actually, I think it was for my birthday, um, she and Kyle paid for my ticket to go visit Universal Studios in Orlando, Islands of Adventure. And uh, I was able to ride there what is now maybe my favorite roller coaster. It is the Velocicoaster. I don't know if any, how many of you have been on the Velocicoaster? Oh, man, you just don't know what you are missing. But uh, as I'm thinking about how can I describe to you the experience of parenting, I thought, well, it's like the Velocicoaster. And so I started to think, well, let me tell you what that's like. And then I thought, you know what? Let me show you what my parenting experience has been like. So I'm going to show you that this morning. This is the Velocicoaster, all right, Universal Studios. Well, parenting is, kind of starts out the same way, with this exciting rush of excitement and adrenaline. Am I not doing that? And it's just thrilling. I mean, it's just this rush of excitement and adrenaline, and then, and then you're just trying to catch your breath, and you realize the thrills just keep coming. I mean, around every curve and every turn, and it's just up and down, and just when you think you've got it, and then, you know, notice, by the way, did you hear the screams in the background? That's very normal. <laughs> yeah, that's just, that's just part of it. The, the, the in fact, there may be some, there may be some vomiting and <laughs> some confusion, and you might black out from time to time, but that's very normal. Don't be surprised. But that's just kind of part of the experience. And so, you know, you're kind of, you're kind of getting a feel, you're holding on for dear life, and you, you, you know, still twist and turn, and again, you finally get to a point where you feel like you can take your breath. Oh, man, finally. I just, I've got this. And just when you think you've got it figured out, kid number two comes. And, and then it's just, there we go again. And... And then you're at this new height, and everything's just wonderful, and everything, oh, man, we got two kids now, and then reality kind of sets in, and it's not going. Oh, you're stuck right there. Uh, 
and then you're back to reality and then there's more twist and now you're upside down and you're going faster and the curves are longer and the challenges are more are greater and then you're just screaming at the top of your lungs and and you know it's thrilling and and then you you know you're going along and then again you think you've got it figured out and then here come the teenagers and this is kind of what it's like to have teenagers you know and and then and then somehow, somehow by God's grace, you survive and you wake up and they graduate and get married. And so that's my parenting experience. And, um, you know, maybe not exactly, but I think you get the point. Now, the question is, how, how exactly does that represent parenting? Why is that accurate? It really comes down to this. And the reason that I showed that and share that as an illustration is really because I think it repre is represented in the title of the message this morning. Because when you describe the Velocicoaster, in my opinion, it's joyful agony. <laughs> you know, it's just this... Man, it, the thrills and the excitement and the rush of adrenaline, you know, and the highs. And I love that stuff. I love riding roller coasters like that. But there's this also this constant fear of doom. And you're holding on. And what's next? And it's always changing. You're not sure what's coming around the next corner. And, and it's just all this, this time of uncertainty. And, and that's how parenting is. Parenting is joyful agony. I mean, some of the greatest thrills, some of the greatest rushes of joy and excitement my wife and I have ever had in our life have been sent around our kids. It's just, that's how it is. Some of the most difficult, challenging, discouraging times in our life have been centered around our kids. You know, that's, that's the reality of parenting. It is a joyful agony. And so this morning, what I want to emphasize, because that is the reality because that is how parenting is. There, there's going to be the great highs and the great lows and the twists and the turns and the days of great joy and the days of great discouragement and confusion and desperation. Those are reality. That's how it's going to be. Because of that, then if we truly understand that what is critically important is that parents have a very clear and precise goal. Something that when all of those twists and turns and ups and downs, something that can clarify your purpose and your focus. So you don't get disoriented on all of those turns and those twists and the highs and the lows. That you can stay focused on what the goal and what the purpose is. Because those days of those heights, so those days when the kids bring home those straight A's on the report card or when you get the phone call from the teacher that they've been suspended, both, both the highs and the lows, you can stay focused on what the goal is, what is the purpose. And that is what we want to help with this morning, reminding ourselves what is that purpose and that goal of biblical parenting so in the midst of the craziness we can stay focused and grounded. We're going to look this morning at two primary points. One is the primary responsibility of parents, and then number two, we'll look at the primary role of parents. So for that, we look this morning at two key passages. The primary responsibility of, pa of parents stated primarily in these two passages, but clarified throughout other places in scriptures. The first one is Ephesians chapter 6. We're familiar. Parents love the first three verses of this chapter. Children, obey your parents. Honor your father and mother. We got those memorized. But then verse 4, here's the purpose. Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That is the purpose. That is the instruction. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. An Old Testament passage that would be a sister passage, if you would, a cross-reference, would be Proverbs chapter 22, another familiar passage, and verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Bring up the child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Train up a child in the way he should go. That's the words of instruction, the parent's ultimate responsibility. Now, just a few quick notes on that before we move on. And that is a couple of notes. Notice number one in Ephesians, 
um, chapter 6, notice it was primarily addressed to fathers. And we emphasize, I want to emphasize that, that the primary responsibility and accountability rest on the shoulders of the father. That is the way God has designed the family to be as the head of the home. The responsibility of bringing up, training up the children rests on the shoulders of the father. That doesn't exclude the mother from her responsibility. And what a wonderful thing is when you're partnering together to accomplish this goal. That's the way it's designed. But the fathers do have a specific accountability before God for that. But notice also, notice these are not passive terms. These are active words of instruction. Bring them up. Train them up. Those are words of instruction. Those are imperatives, words of action, not passion, not passive words. These are active words. The point being this, if you don't, if you do not intentionally raise up your children, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, it will not just happen. It doesn't just happen that your child, if you don't train them up and bring them up in the things of the Lord, you're not just going to wake up someday and at 20 they're walking in the ways of the Lord and knowing God and serving God. It just doesn't happen. In fact, let me share, share the other side of it. You're, you have been gifted with little sinners. <laughs> and if left to themselves, they will go their own way. Not the way of the Lord. <laughs> They will go their own way because that's what sinners do. And so left to themselves. So parents have to actively with intention train up, bring up their children, the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And then notice in that Proverbs passage, it says train up. That word train actually is translated, used in a different way in the Chronicles when Solomon was dedicating the temple. The temple that God used Solomon to build for his glory. It says they dedicated the temple. See, same idea here to train up your children, to dedicate to. Kind of what we're doing this morning is this idea of dedication. That is, this temple is being set aside for a purpose. That's the idea. We are we are doing this for a purpose. This this temple has a purpose of worshiping God, etc. And that's the idea of this word train up. Understanding that there is a purpose. God has gifted you with that child for a purpose. And that purpose is to dedicate, to train up that child to know God and walk in His ways. Well, there's also, understand, again, we're not taking the time to turn. There's Psalm 127. You can turn there some other time. Psalm 127, verse 4, where the psalmist compares children to arrows in the hands of a mighty man. And children are like arrows. And what is the point there? Parents, you have the responsibility to point them in a certain direction. They are going to go a certain direction. Your job as the, the bow, holding the bow, is to point the arrow in the direction they ought to go. They ought to go this direction. And that is the job of the one pulling the bow. The child is the arrow. That's the idea of dedicate to, to train up with a specific purpose and target in mind. Well, what is that target? Based on God's Word, not based on the most popular children's book out there, but based on God's Word, what is the purpose? What is the target? My child's an arrow. I'm going to aim them and go this direction. And we would say it this way. This is on your outline. We would say the goal or the target is to intentionally prepare your child while they are teachable and under your direct authority to know God and walk in His ways through every season of life. If we were to summarize it, the target is to know God and to walk in His ways for His glory. That's what we want our children to do. That's the target. So that while they are under my direct authority, while I, they are still teachable, while they are still my responsibility, during those years, however long that may be, my goal is to direct their life in a way so that they will know their God. And, oh, salvation comes into that, know their God and what He's done for them, who He is, and live a life for His glory. That's the goal. That's what, that, that is the responsibility that God has placed on us as parents. That is the target we're aiming for. 
So in those crazy days of ups and downs and all of this, it's so easy to get discouraged because this is happening. And it's so easy to get frustrated or to get, get out of focus because of this. Come back to whatever that day is like. Just come back to and remember, you know what? The ultimate goal here is still the same. Stay focused. It's to help train them, bring them up to know their God, to love him and walk in his ways, glorify his name. And that's the purpose. Now, that's not necessarily easy, but it gives some clarity to what I'm supposed to do so that we don't come up with false standards of success as parents, because that's what happens. If you don't have a goal, you're going to make up one, right? And your goal becomes, well, your goal might be survival. You know, hey, we succeeded. My kid didn't get arrested this year. You know, that's, we, gotta, we start making up goals. Well, my kid's not as bad as the neighbor kid's. You know, at least he's not. We come up with all kind of goals. No, let's stay focused. As Christian parents, our job, our target is so that they know God and walk in his ways for his glory. That's what we want to help to achieve. So that's the responsibility. So if that's the goal, if that's the responsibility, then number two, what is the primary role of the parents? Parents have all kind of, we wear all kind of hats. You're a. The provider, your protector, your coach, you're the cook, you're the banker, you're the police, you're the drill instructor, you know, all, all kind of hats. But the primary, we would, I believe based on scripture, when you take all the passages that deal with parents' responsibility, I think the primary role that Christian parents have been given is teacher. It's teacher. Train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Train them up in the way they should go is that primary responsibility or role of the parent is teacher. So let's look at those and look at four points underneath that. First of all, note the command to teach. Two passages, you may still be in Proverbs. Flip over to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. And we see this expectation of Scripture for parents. Proverbs 4 verse 1 Hear ye, children, the instruction of the Father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also, and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, and keep my commandments in love. That is the expectation of Scriptures, that the parents will teach the children, and then they will teach their children, and they will teach their children. And that is the expectation and design of Scripture. Well, notice over in Deuteronomy, if you have a bookmark there or a finger in Deuteronomy chapter 6, this was the instruction clearly given to the people of Israel. Moses gave them this instruction prior to their going into the promised land. They were just about to cross the Jordan River. And when you get into the land, you need to remember what I've commanded you. And he says it here in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Once again, we have a different context because here's the nation of Israel and the law and the wilderness. And we understand the difference. But the expectation is the same. It's the parents that would teach the children. And they were to do that diligently. That word diligent means to strike repeatedly. Kind of as you're sharpening a knife, to strike, be strict, stricken repeatedly so that it sharpens. To impress deeply upon is the idea there. Now, again, for time, just jot down one other reference. Galatians chapter 4 and verse one, verses 1 and 2. Galatians chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. And I think this is an encouraging word to parents, but to... Again, it drives home this point. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 say this. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. So that kind of addresses this question. Okay, I'm to teach my children. Does that mean I do all the teaching? Does that mean I have to homeschool my kids? Although I think that's a great option. It's not the option for everybody. So what about sending them to school, whatever? Okay, notice, maybe you're going to hire or use the assistance of tutors and governors. 
But notice the very clear statement after that. Until a time appointed by whom? The Father. It's the father, again, the parents who even when we dish out some of that responsibility, it's still the parents ultimately who are responsible. They're the ultimate ones so that they are, the parents are the ones who are held accountable by God for the teaching of the children. That's the command. That is the biblical expectation responsibility. It falls on the parents. Well, notice number two, the content to teach. The content to teach, and for this we go back to Proverbs, this time chapter 24. Proverbs 24. So, okay, I'm, I'm instructed to teach my children. What am I to teach them? Well, let's look at what Proverbs 24 says about that. Verses 3 and 4. Through wisdom is an house builded, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Notice there's three descriptions here of this house that's being builded. It is a house that's being built, it's established, and it is filled with precious and pleasant riches. This is a strong, established, firm house that is happy and satisfied. This is a, this is a solid, good home that's being built here. And there's three requirements. Notice what they are. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. All three of those are required to build a strong, happy home. It needs knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Let's break those down. What is knowledge? That is information. You need to teach your children certain information. Information of, number one, they need to know truth about God, who He is, what He's done. They need to know the Scriptures. They need to know the Gospel. They need to know about the creation. They need to know the doctrines of salvation and sin and heaven and judgment. They need to know truth as God has revealed it to us, as God has revealed himself. They need to know their God. They need to know they were not. They have not evolved over millions of years of a natural process of it. They are fearfully and wonderfully made and designed by a creator God who loves them. They need to know that. And there, that list is lengthy of the truth they need to know. And they need to know life skills. They need to know what, it, what it, marriage is, the responsibility and role of a husband and a wife. They need to know what the family should look like, what finances, etiquette, all of these things. And the list goes on and on. So we say, who is responsible to teach them that? Well, the spiritual things are the church's responsibility. Well, the other things are the school's responsibility. Okay, can you use tutors? Can you use the governors? Can you use Sunday school teachers and pastors? Yes, but it's not our responsibility to teach your children. Your responsibility, the parents' responsibility. So when you come to the judgment seat of Christ, why didn't your children know this about me? Because, the, well, the church failed. and there was, Well, maybe we did, but ultimately... The responsibility falls on you. If you want your children, if your child should know that about God and about the Scriptures, you need to be sure they're learning it. You need to take that responsibility. Be sure they know what they're supposed to know. So that falls ultimately on the, on the parents to betray or to teach information, knowledge. Well, then understanding, and that is explanation. Explanation. If I were to ask you, what are kids, especially toddlers, you know, three to six, what is their favorite word? No, no, I heard no. Yeah, that's, that's one of them. And the other one is, I heard it, why? We'll do this. Well, why? Well, because I said, well, why? Well, because why is the sky blue? Well, because God made it that way. Well, why? You know, and it goes on and on and on. We know, right? Well, that's understanding. Because your responsibility is not just to inform them, but to explain to them why. Understanding. You need to help them to understand these truths. I would suggest this is critical, and it's so often the missing step. Understanding. Look at Proverbs 7, just real quick. Proverbs chapter 7. This is an amazing statement. Proverbs chapter 7, it says in verse 6, he says, At the window of my house I looked through my casement, and behold, among the simple ones, he said, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. He'd probably been taught. He probably went to Sunday school. 
all of his life. And he had learned the scriptures. He could quote John 3.16 in the books of the Bible, but he was void of understanding. And that is so often the case with our children. They learn facts about God. They learn facts about scriptures. They learn certain, they're told certain things, but over a period of time, they need to be, they need to come to understanding of why that's the case. And that needs to be taught them from scriptures. So why, why do I have to go to church? Why can't I watch that on TV? Why do I have to wear that? All of my friends are doing this. Why can't I go there with them? And if your only answer is because I said so, that is wonderful when they're three. <laughs> That's not what you should say when they're 16. Because if they're 16, the only reason they think they shouldn't do that is because mom said so. They are void of understanding. And they're going to rebel. And they're going to go their own way. They need understanding. So somewhere along the line, you've got to sit down with them as they get older and understand. This is why we don't do that. This is why we don't say that. This is why we go to church. And so that they can adopt those same convictions and have understanding of why we do that, and why God says this, and why God does what he does. Why did God judge the earth with water and all of that? They need to not be void of understanding. And again, it's part of the teaching process of helping them to understand God's word. And then equally important is wisdom. And that is application. And children need help applying their knowledge and understanding to life. And that is your responsibility, parents, to help them apply those truths to life. A couple of examples. Matthew, you read Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, and you teach your children. You know what Jesus said? He said to love your enemies. Pray for them and bless them. He said to do that. Well, you need, they need to know that. That's what Scripture says. That's the expectation of our Savior. Love your enemies. Well, what does it mean to love? You know, when we start studying that word about agape love, that means unconditionally sacrificially giving yourself for the good of somebody else, even to those who are your enemies, those who wish you harm, those who have done you harm. That's what it means. So we have understanding. Well, now how do I apply that? And you need to help your kids apply that when they go to school. Because guess what? They'll have enemies at school. Well, how are they to apply that in their life, at school, in their neighborhood, so that by the time they are old and walking on their own, they've learned what it means to love your enemies. And you've helped them apply that to their life. So it's knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Another example, 1 Timothy 6.6 6 says, Godliness without, with contentment is great gain. Well, again, your child can memorize that and not have a clue what it means. Teach them what contentment is. What that, what that means, what is contentment, and then help them apply it. One of the ways a content heart would apply that truth is saying thanks and being grateful and not complaining and not demanding that I get this for my birthday and not being upset when they didn't get this for Christmas. And wait a second, we're not applying contentment to our life. I've got to help them understand if you're content, this is what it looks like. And helping apply. So the content is important as well. Notice the context. For that, we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, the context. And we would say, <clears throat> so when are we to teach our children and where are we to teach them? And the answer is anytime, anywhere. All the time, everywhere. <laughs> we would say that. Deuteronomy 6, we already read it. Verse 7, teach them diligently unto thy children. Verse 7, and that shalt, you shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Notice those two, two elements of education. Number one is formal. There are formal times. There ought to be times when you as parents sit your children down and teach them the word of God. You're teaching them just formally. Okay, this is when we, whether it's family devotions or just other times, okay, we're going to study the Bible today. We're going to learn these truths. We're going to learn about what God is doing. You're taking them to church, making sure that's a formal time. Somebody else is teaching them, but you're following up with that. One of, one of the traditions that our kids loved, they know what I'm going to talk about. 
they loved every Sunday when we went home after church and sat down for dinner, they know what the first question was going to be out of my mouth. All right, tell me what you learned in Sunday school today <laughs> you know, or in the church service. You know, and try, just formal times when, okay, we're going to follow up. Somebody else taught you this morning. Let's follow up. What did you learn? And uh, what's the scripture? How are you going to, you understand what that means? All right, how, how's that going to make a difference in your life this week? Wisdom, knowledge, understanding wisdom, and taking those times. There needs to be those formal times, but there are informal times. It says, when you're walkest by the way. Man, those are some of the best times to teach. Why do you think God made the rainbow? Drive by a car accident. You know. And if, what do you think would happen to that person if they died? Those are awesome opportunities to teach. Just going through life, teaching them what it, what it means and to make an application to life and all of those things. So that's the context anytime, anywhere, all the time, everywhere. But there needs to be formal and those informal times of teaching. And then finally, notice the character of the teacher. And this is critical as well. I put two verses there on the outline. Won't turn to those. Stay there in Deuteronomy for just a minute. But the other two, Proverbs 23, 26. Let mine eyes observe my ways. For a parent to say to their children, Watch me. I'm going to show you what walking in the Lord, way of the Lord is looks like. Watch me. I'm going to show you. This is what it looks like. I have led thee in the right paths, Proverbs 4.11. Man, what a humbling statement that is. You know, <clears throat> when I was, uh, I think it was between my junior and senior year in high school, lived in North Carolina. I had to take driver's education in order to get my driver's license. You had to take edu driver's ed if you wanted to get it before you were 18. And so in the summer, I took a summer class. And so my driver instruct instructor actually picked me up at my house for about, I don't know, two, a, a week or two of classes. He picked me up at my house. And then we'd go and we'd pick up the other girl and guy that were with us. And then we'd do our driving test. And he'd pick us up. Well, he, the driver instructor would pick us up, and he'd pull out of the driveway. He's got his window down. He's got his window, his arm hanging out the window. He's got the music blaring. He's got his hand up on the steering wheel. And I don't know how fast he was going, but he probably wasn't always going the speed limit. And he, every morning, just about every morning, the first thing he'd say, do as I say, not as I do. You know, and that was, his, that was how he instructed us. And then we get to where we switch, and I'm driving, and the window's up. My hands are what? Ten and two. Radio's off, my seatbelt's on, I'm checking the mirrors. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. That doesn't work for parents. That can't be your motto as parents. It can't be do as I say. I can't expect my children to walk in the ways of the Lord, to know God, if I'm not. If I'm not. They have to see me consistently, not perfectly, but consistently. Walking in the ways of the Lord, if I expect that they will. Deuteronomy chapter 6 just drives this home. Look, I love this. Look at Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6 one more last time and we'll, we'll close. Verse 4 said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our, our God is one Lord. And then down at verse six, 7 we said, Teach them dilig diligently to their children. Okay, these things that I've commanded you. But what's in between there? You, parents, shall love the Lord thy God with all thine heart all thy soul and all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine hearts. Then teach them diligently to your children. Then and only then. You want your children to love the Lord with all their heart, soul, and mind and follow Him and obey Him no matter what. They've got to see it first in you. That is critical part of instructing our children, teaching and training them up is living a life of consistency so they see what, what ultimately we want for them, they see in our lives. Not biblical, not, not sinless perfection, but a life of humility following Christ, seeking to live for His glory, knowing Him and walking in His ways for the glory of God. It's These numbers shock me every time I look them up. And they, today was not any different, or this week was no different. These two articles. This is, I just, I look them up again just to kind of get 
recent up-to-date numbers. This is a 2024 article, and the article suggests that the, the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, reports that the average daily time spent by children ages 11 to 18 is eight hours of screen time. Eight hours a day on some kind of screen, phone, TV, computer, eight hours a day, and that does not include their time in school. Eight hours a day, average. And of that eight hours, according to another survey by the Gallup, a Gallup survey, again, this year, the average U.S. teenager spends 4.8 hours on social media every day. Now, why did I tell you that? Somebody's teaching your kids. Somebody's influencing them. They're listening to somebody tell them how they should live their life. That primary responsibility is the parents. Godly parents. That doesn't mean I'm not advocating no screen time and no social media. Although there may be a time and a place for those boundaries. But understanding that you have to take the reins. You are the one responsible. And it's not just going to happen that someday they're going to be walking in the ways of the Lord. Now, the wonderful thing is... We know this very special, very, very special thing called God's grace. Because many, if not most of the adults in this room, did not have godly parents that led them in the way they should go. I understand that. And so why are you, how is it possible you're here today? It's by God's grace that you didn't have a home that loved you and led you in the way of the Lord. You know what? Praise God for His grace that intervened in your life. But that's not God's design. God's design is that in the home, the parents in a godly marriage are given this wonderful gift of children, and they are given the biblical responsibility to raise those children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And to the glory of God, we want to maintain and encourage that biblical standard. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for these reminders Father, it's, it is an incredible, incredible joy to be a parent. And especially thinking of these three families this morning, what a joy it is. And I know they've already experienced the joy of being parents. But, Father, it's one of the more difficult, challenging tasks we're given. And, Father, I think they probably already know it. They've already experienced the sleepless nights and the challenges of parenting and the frustrations that come along with it. But Father, I just pray that today, them and all of us, you just cheer our hearts because of your grace. We cannot successfully fulfill this responsibility. But Father, by your grace, you can enable us to do what you've called us to do. And we pray that for these families. We pray that, Father, for each one of us. And we pray, Father, we take the standard of your word and as we preach it and we share it, we pray, Father, that you just help parents to stay focused and not be drawn away by the material things of this world, but just stay focused on what it is their purpose is and what an incredible joy it is, even though it's difficult. I just pray that you'd encourage them in that task. And thank you again for your grace that enables us to do what you, we could not without you do. And we thank you for that. So we just commit this to you. We thank you for what you do with it in each heart. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take our hymn books, and um, I'm sorry, Josh, I forgot to write down the number. 270. 270 in the hymn books. I would be like Jesus in, in, the, in the home. I, I want to illustrate what Christ's likeness looks like. We're going to stand. We'll sing a couple of verses. Maybe there's somebody here this morning. I don't want to neglect to say this. Somebody here this morning says, you know what? Pastor, I don't even know I'm saved. If I, if I were to die today, I don't know if I'd go to heaven or hell. I've got a lot of questions. I'm confused. We'd love to talk to you. Even while we're singing, we would invite you. You could step out down the side. We'll have somebody take God's word and just go get that settled and settled in your heart and know what God's word says about how you can be saved by trusting Christ alone. Parents, we just pray that you be encouraged. I know this is challenging 
But God's grace enables, and we just pray that God will help you apply this to your life. And for the rest of us, we just pray that um, we'll be an encouragement and help as our parents seek to do what God's called them to do. So let's stand together, 270, sing a couple of verses before we go. Again, after the service, if, if the Lord's speaking to your heart about something, you've got questions, concerns, if we can help you, as soon as the service is dismissed, I'll be available. Josh is available. We have others, and we'd love to take time to talk to you. Don't leave today. If you've got any concerns, any questions, we can help you with. But I am going to invite you, if you would, for just a few more minutes to be seated. And uh, again, we're going to conclude our time this morning with a brief child dedication service and uh, just to get things started uh, we're going to invite uh, our three families uh, to come in at this point join me up on the platform Well, we're so thankful to have these families join us this, this morning. And do you notice how quiet it is? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Actually, Ben told me if there's any screaming, it was going to be him probably. <laughs> but, uh, so you're doing good. Thank you're you. doing good, Ben. So, um, but man, it's an amazing. But uh, we're so thankful. Um, these three families, let me first of all introduce them. If you don't know, this is Ben and Lael Bowder. And this is Emerson, better known as Emmy. And uh, eight or nine months old? Nine months old. And then Isaiah and Liz Armour, and this is Elijah, and two months about? What was his, when was his birthday? Uh, February 1st. February 1st. So just over two months, little Elijah. And then Lauren uh, James, her husband Anthony, I assume is working. Yeah, unfortunately, he works uh, most Sundays, couldn't be here. So granddaddy stepped in. What do they call you, by the way? Poppy. Poppy. We're glad to have Poppy up here. And, um, and Mickey. Yes, that's Mickey. I didn't even have to introduce Mickey. This is Michael, better known as Mickey, and little brother Nicholas. And um, Mickey's, uh, their, their ages are? Nicholas is six, almost seven months, yeah. and Mickey four years old. All right. So let me first of all, before we move forward, let me, let me just kind of explain what we're not doing this morning. This, this is not any kind of christening or baptizing of children. That's not going to happen this morning. And what we're doing this morning has nothing, zero to do with the salvation of these children. 
All right, so just want to be very clear, them coming up here for this ceremony does not impact their eternal destiny and their relationship with God one bit. These children, we believe biblically, and the parents understand this, these children will need to grow up, and with the leadership of these parents, they themselves will need to know God and place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior at some point. And that's what we want to join them in prayer for. So this is not a time for the illustration. These children are being saved or anything happening today that contributes to their spiritual well-being. So that's not what this is doing. And this is also not a dedication of these children to full-time service. It's not like Hannah gave her child to Sam Samuel, uh, her child to uh, Samuel to the priest. Although if, if you'd like to volunteer to, you know, hand them over for ministry purposes, we can have a conversation about that. But that's not the intent this morning, not some kind of public, these children are going to be used in full-time service. So what are we doing? There's two things. One is these parents are publicly coming before you this morning to basically confirm that they would like to fulfill the responsibility that they have been presented with this morning from Scripture. And that is to train up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And they want to, their children to know God and walk in His ways. And so them being up here this morning is just to acknowledge that publicly. They recognize these children are gifts from God. Man, they, we didn't even get to that passage. Children are a heritage of the Lord. What an amazing gifts. And I know you guys know that. But as stewards of these children, they want to publicly acknowledge that they want to train up these children to know God and walk in His ways. And so we appreciate them wanting to do that. And we want to encourage that as a local church. That is happening less and less in our culture. And we want to encourage the biblical standard of family and those responsibilities. So we're thankful that they're doing that. But we also, the other side of this this morning is as a church, we want to communicate to these families, we are all for you in doing this. We support you in raising up your children to know God and walk in His ways. And as a local church, we want to assure you of our prayers. We understand the we understand the joys and the agony <laughs> of parenting, and we, we know it's a battle. And we want to say to you this morning, thank you for your desire to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and we're here to help. We'll be praying for you, and we we're here to assist. I can't speak for everybody, but there might even be a babysitter in, or two in here. If you're just on those lows where you just have to get away, you know, let, how can we help? We're here. We want to help you fulfill God's command to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So it's both and this morning. It's your public acknowledgement, but we want as a church to acknowledge that and say that to you this morning. So what we want to do is we really want to have a prayer of dedication. And that is just with these families, join them in acknowledging that responsibility in a prayer of dedication. What a beautiful word again. And what a beautiful picture of the arrow. We want to join them in helping them point these children in the direction they should go, which is to know God and walk in His ways. So let's bow together in prayer and have this prayer of dedication for these children and these families this morning. Father, we thank You so much. We praise You for Your Word and we thank You for the family. You have designed and created it to be a wonderful thing. We know sin has corrupted it and our families struggle. We, to some degree, we're all dysfunctional families because we're sinners. But Father, we just pray for these three families specifically as they seek to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to know you and to walk in your ways. Father, we know this world will be a very little help in doing that. In fact, there'll be so many temptations and ways to pull them away from that and distract them. But I just thank you that they want to come publicly and acknowledge before you and this church that their desire is to train their children the way they should go. And Father, I just pray for them, each one. Pray for Ben and Lael and little Emmy. We pray, Father, that she would, at a, at a young age, know who God is, know that He loves her and has given His Son to die for her, that she would come to faith and trust in Christ. 
We pray for Isaiah and Liz, and we pray the same thing for little Elijah. Father, I just pray that at some point you'll work in his heart and that he too will surrender his life and, and know Christ and, and trust in him for salvation. And Father, we pray that for Lauren and Anthony. We pray for little Mickey and for Nicholas. Father, they too would come to know Christ and that they would live their lives for your glory. That is what you have designed and created them to do. And so we just pray for them as they seek to do that. We know, Father, the sleepless nights and the difficult trials and all the agony. But, Father, we just pray that they'll keep focused on what you have given them, that responsibility you've given them, and know that you, by your grace, will enable them to do that as they follow you. So we thank you for that. And as a church, we just want to pray that you'll help us to be the help to be there to come alongside and to encourage and to pray for them and just assure them that they're not alone in this battle, that uh, we want to see them succeed in fulfilling that responsibility. We thank you. We know there's grandparents here this morning and great-grandparents. We know, Father, that there's, there's f other family members and friends, and uh, we thank you for their love and support as well. We just pray your blessings on these families and encourage them in, in this challenge of parenting, especially in this day in which we live. And we just commit this them to you. We dedicate, we point them toward you for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've got just a little something for you guys this morning. And um, hopefully these things will help. For the parents, number one, we just want to clarify, um, there's really only one book that you need to ultimately follow and obey, and that's the Word of God. Amen. And so that is the ultimate uh, standard. We have a book for you this morning that we want to gift to you because we believe it does a good job of applying those biblical principles to parenting. It's written by Paul Chappell. It's called Making Homework. And um, we trust it will be a, a help and encouragement to you guys in your challenge of, of um, parenting. I know you got your hands full. But then we've got something for the kids this morning, too. And um, just again to say, we, we just um, really praying for these guys and uh, look forward to seeing what the Lord has for them. So a little something for Emmy. There you go. And I don't know what order these are in. Look at that. Elijah. And then for Nicholas and Mickey. So you want to take both of those? You got it? And um, once again, we love you guys. Thank you so much for for publicly acknowledging this this morning and, and just rest assured that uh, we're here to help and encourage and we're praying for you guys in this challenge of raising your children and we're always here to help. Let's just express our appreciation to this families this morning as they go. Thank you so much. <laughs> Y'all are welcome to going out. Thank you. God bless you, man. All right. Well, let's stand together. We're going to be dismissed with a word of prayer. And as you have opportunity, if you haven't already introduced yourself to the families, um, individually go to them and express your support and uh, let them know you'll be praying for them and helping. And even volunteer to babysit if you can do that or helping out some other way. Some of you, some of you are in the same stage they're in. And man, you know, raising children today is a challenge. I know it's always a challenge in every generation. Uh, but man, some of the temptations and some of the th ways the world is pulling and fighting against them is things we'll, we didn't experience raising our children. And so we need to be praying for them diligently and helping them. So thank you for your presence today and your encouragement. Let's close in prayer. Father, we do thank you. Thank you for family. And Father, we know that, again, so many of us, our experience may be dysfunctional. But Father, we thank you for the family of God. And we thank you that as a family of God, we can come around these families and encourage and help them. And we just continue to pray for them. Thank you for your instruction from your word this morning. As we dismiss, we just pray that you'll go with us and work through our lives so that we can be a light in the darkness that others might know our wonderful Savior and glorify him. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.